1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 is where we'll center our study this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Good to see you this morning. Appreciate, uh, again, the help uh, to get up here and uh, to be in front of you. And appreciate so much those who have led our worship so far. It's helped me to be able to draw closer to God, think more about the things that we read about in the New Testament. I appreciate that so much. Good to see you. I have to uh, say a couple of things before I get started. Um, first of all, before I forget, uh, this evening, the uh, classes that we had in the Sunday evening class here in the auditorium last month that dealt with some sensitive topics. We've had some requests from several of you, and the elders have decided that we should do a couple of follow-up classes this month. So tonight, in the Sunday night class, we're going to have the high school and junior high kids in here again. Young people, sorry, not kids. Uh, the young people in here uh, for our Sunday night class, and we're going to do a follow-up class about homosexuality tonight. And then in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have another class that will be sort of a follow-up and sort of sum up everything that we've talked about in general in that. So for the month of May, we're going to be doing the same thing we did for the month of April, and I wanted to let you all know about that so we can plan accordingly. I also want to say uh, thank you to all of you who were so kind to me uh, this week, as I have my surgery, and you're bringing food, and you're calling me, and you're asking about me and praying for me, I just appreciate it so much. Sometimes uh, when we're in good health, we don't realize how much people care. And then when we get sick, or we have problems, or for some reason our legs quit working like mine did for one step the other night, suddenly you realize how much people do care. And I just appreciate it so much. It's been a wonderful experience, at least that part of it, uh, for me. Uh, some were suggesting that because I, I've had this injury that maybe it would make my preaching a little shorter. And uh, I just have to say, I'm sitting down. I'm much more comfortable. I think we could go a couple hours. Uh, I think we could easily do that. No, I, I appreciate you guys so much. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21 is where I want to read. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 says, <clears throat> But test everything, hold fast what is good. Test everything. Hold fast what is good. People tell us a lot of things, and almost all of them claim that what they're telling us is true. You have politicians who tell us about their records and about their ambitions and about the rightness of their cause, and they usually sound pretty good until you hear the other side, and then they come along and say the exact opposite. Or have you ever had the experience of a friend or someone you know well coming and saying, let me tell you what happened? And it sounds great. It sounds like they've really been wronged. And then you hear the other side. There's a proverb about that that says, the first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. We have this problem all the time where, where we have competing versions of what's true, and they can't all be right. And so we can't just believe everything that we hear. And we experience that in the realm of public discourse, but in no realm is that as widespread as when we talk about religion. Just turn on the TV for a minute and listen to people who preach in the name of Jesus. And you'll see one well-kept, smooth-talking, always-smiling man telling you that you need to just accept Jesus into your heart and you need to pray this prayer. And then he'll say, we believe you just got born again. Or... Another man will tell you you need to make a love offering and that if you make a love offering of this much that God will pay off your credit card bill this month. Or you can read another man who says that the world is about to end. Specifically, the world is about to end if you don't support Israel politically right now. And in a climate like that, we're left wondering, well, Who's right and who's wrong? What, how can I know what's true and what's not? The, the shocking thing about that is that all of those positions have some biblical backing, but all of them are wrong. So how can we weed through all of that? That's the question that we have to face in a time like ours. Now, a lot of people deal with that by becoming gullible. That is, they say, you know what, I'm going to find my guy. And I'm just going to hitch my wagon to his star. Whatever he says, I'm going with. I'm going to go with this church. I'm going to go with this preacher. And I'm going to follow him no matter what. Or I'm going to go with this politician. I'm going to follow him or her. And they're going to take me where I want to go. 
But other people go the other direction and they say, you know what, you can't believe anybody these days. Let's just not believe anything. They become skeptical or cynical. They say, nobody's telling the truth. I can't trust anyone. And let's be honest, both of those are tempting because being skeptical and being gullible are easy. In fact, I would go further. I would say they're lazy because they don't require any effort. I just believe what someone else tells me or I just disbelieve what someone else tells me. So, I want to talk about a different approach. I want to talk about the 1 Thessalonians 5.21 approach. What we're going to call this morning, I like to call it the investigation mindset. Now, I know, I don't, don't calm down, Barry. I know the word is investigative and that I probably should have done it that way, but that's okay. That's what I like to call it. It's the way I think about it. It's an investigation that, that we have an obligation to investigate and to look into truth claims, wherever they may come from, so that we can know what's right and wrong in the kind of world that we live in. So I just want to take a few minutes and explore the mindset 1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us to have as Christians because it is incredibly relevant to the world we live in today. So 1 Thessalonians 5.21, but test everything, hold fast what is good. Test all things is the first part of the investigation mindset. Test is the word that was used to talk about testing the genuineness of metals. That's done by putting the metal over a fire and removing the impurities, revealing the impurities and removing them so that what's left is genuine. You know it's pure. And so test all things means put all things over the fire and make sure that they really are what they claim to be. And the most notable thing about this statement is the all things. Test everything. If you look in the context here, look back in verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 16, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. You see all the emphatic, the, the uh, hyperbole in that, always, in all things, without ceasing. Okay, All three of those statements have that emphatic idea to them, meaning these are universal attitudes. These are practices that should be done all the time. Then he says in verse 19, do not quench the spirit. And in verse 20, do not despise prophecies. So don't minimize the influence and work of God. Now this is a time in which people were coming and they were saying, I'm a prophet of God. I have the spirit of God. I have spiritual gifts. And there is a concern that they will either be gullible or skeptical. So on the gullible side, it would be, well, whoever says that, I automatically believe them, even if they're not telling the truth. That's a danger. But if I'm on the skeptical side, that means God can't speak to me even if God is speaking through this very person. And so he says, don't despise prophecies. So we have both of those parts of the mentality that we can't be gullible and that we can't be cynical. Instead, he says in verse 21, test everything, hold fast what is good. Test them. And if it passes the test, keep it. If it doesn't pass the test, discard it. So, I want you to leave your marker or your finger here, 1 Thessalonians 5. We're going to go to several passages right now. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4. If that was true in the time when apostles led the New Testament church, how can it not be true today? The, the idea of needing to question, needing to examine, needing to test, needing to investigate. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Do not believe every spirit, he says. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. So someone comes and they say, I have the spirit of God. I'm speaking, this is from God. Don't believe every spirit. That's what scripture says. Don't just believe them because of what they claim, but test the spirits to see whether they are of God. Part of testing all things, I'm going to say it again, is not believing everything we hear. Do not believe every spirit. And we need a mentality that is prepared to hold things at arm's length until we are certain they are true. I'm not just going to believe it because you said it. I'm not just going to believe it because I like you. I liked what Albert Barnes said about this in his comment. He said, the meaning here is that they were to carefully examine everything proposed for their belief. They were not to receive it on trust, to take it on assertion, to believe it because it was urged with vehemence, zeal, or plausibility. 
do not believe every spirit. And I need to say this, that means we don't believe everything that's stated from this pulpit or down here in front of this pulpit just because it comes from someone we know. I'm not somehow different and not subject to being tested like everyone else who speaks in the name of God. We have to test the spirits and see whether they are of God. So how do we do that? Look in verse 2. In verse 2 of 1 John 4, it says, By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. So here the idea is we are comparing what someone is saying to what we already know to be true, the idea that Jesus has come in the flesh. Someone is not going to confess that. Then we, we test them against what we know to be true, and we find them failing, and so we discard their message. That's not true. It doesn't agree with what's from God. Testing, then, involves taking what we know is true and comparing any new message or any new idea to what we already know is true and is from God. I want to show you a great example of that. Acts chapter 17. Acts 17. I don't know of any better example of what we're talking about, the investigation mindset, than this example of the Bereans in Acts chapter 17. Acts 17 and verse 10. Acts 17 and verse 10, it says, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Acts 17, 11, Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. So Paul and Silas come into the synagogue at Berea, and they are preaching strange new things. What do these Jews do? Well, it says specifically in verse 11, they receive the word with all eagerness. They're commended for that because it says they were more noble than the ones in Thessalonica that ran them out of town. They were more noble because they received the word with all eagerness, and they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They examined, they investigated, they tested. So, they didn't hear Paul and Silas coming to preach and say, nope, they're wrong, this can't be true. And they didn't say, oh, it's Paul, he's got to be right. They said, let's listen to what he says, and let's examine the scripture to see if what he's saying matches up with what we know is true. It reminds me of Isaiah 8 and verse 20, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Let's go study. Let's go figure it out. Instead of saying, oh, I don't like that Paul. He needs to get a haircut. I don't really like the way he talked. Or instead of saying, you know, I like that Paul. He's great. Whatever he says goes. No, there's a third option. There's a middle ground that says, well, is what Paul is saying true? Let's go figure that out. Let's go investigate. And I want you to hear me clearly. Truth has nothing to fear from honest examination. Ever. We should never be afraid to look into things. We should never be afraid to compare what someone is saying by what we know is true from the gospel. There is no fear when we're telling the truth of honest, intense examination. That's what you see in the Bereans. That's why they're commended. And it's no surprise when it says in verse 12, therefore many of them believed. Of course they're going to believe if it's true and they're this eager to find the truth, then not only are they going to find it, but when they find it, they're going to obey it. That's exactly what they do. They had the mindset that we're seeking. I know of no better distillation of 1 Thessalonians 5.21 than right here in Acts 17. That is exactly what Paul means when he says, test all things, hold fast what is good. Go with me to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2. Revelation 2 and verse 2. Revelation 2, 2. The text says, I know your works. It's Jesus writing to the church in Ephesus. Revelation 2, 2. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. So some claim to be apostles, he says, but they were not apostles. How do they know the difference? Well, it says it in the verse, doesn't it? You tested them, and you found that they weren't. 
And so you dismissed them. You didn't listen to them. They tested them. So what that means is, and I think we need to hear this point. This is a subtle distinction. There are some, some claims of truth that are going to be easy to dismiss. Okay, remember what we read in 1 John 4? Whoever doesn't confess or doesn't confess that Jesus came in the flesh. That's an easy one, right? Somebody says, no, I don't believe Jesus came in the flesh. Well, we don't have any trouble with that. This is more difficult. This is someone who is claiming to be an apostle but is not. And there is a test that they have to go through. We have an obligation to test them, to examine them, to see whether they're, what they're saying is true, and then to listen or to not listen to them. So some are going to be easy. Some are going to be more challenging. Sometimes the distinctions are going to be more subtle. And we have to be prepared. We have to be prepared to investigate. It reminds me of this in, in Matthew 4 when Jesus is tempted. And it says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. Satan speaking to him, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. You see, wow. As the debate escalates in Jesus' temptation, and it goes from Jesus do this to Jesus do this because God says you should do this, that Jesus has to say it is written again, that there has to be sort of an answer made. Instead of it just saying, no, you're off on this one. I'm not supposed to worship Satan. I'm just supposed to worship God. Instead, Jesus has to say, no, it's a little more complex than that, Satan. It's written again. There is more to this than what you're saying. You see how there is subtlety in Satan's approach. And therefore, testing all things can become more challenging. But, I will say this. If I understand Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 14 correctly, that testing should get a little bit easier as we grow and mature. Because it describes how, as we are mature, not only can we eat solid food, but we have the ability to discern between good and evil on a different level. Test all things. Test all things as part of it. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians 5. We need to catch the second part. Test all things. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 21. But test everything. Hold fast what is good. So that's the second part. Hold fast what's good. Hold fast means to hold down or to keep or possess or retain, to cling to it. So, we have the idea of testing everything, but then clinging to what we know is, without question, biblical. And so he says in verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. Keep away. Hold yourself back from it. If you discover it is evil, don't have anything to do with it. So you have this, this idea of when we run it through the test, then we know how we should treat it from then on. How we should treat that error. How we should treat that person. What should we do about this? is what a part of the test is. Remember, that's what happened with the Bereans. When after they investigated, it says, therefore many of them believed. Okay, So they tested everything, and then when they found it was good, they held to it. They became believers and followers of what they now knew to be true. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, just a page or two over here. 2 Thessalonians 2, beginning in verse 9. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they, received, they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now this is an important verse and I... I I hesitate to bring up 2 Thessalonians 2 because, and Todd's teaching 2 Thessalonians, he can attest to this too, there are some challenging things in this chapter about the man of sin and what's restraining and all of that. But I, I think there is a message here in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12 that if we are unwilling to love truth and seek truth, that we are vulnerable to the efforts of Satan. That if I don't care what's true, and I don't care enough to seek out what's true, then I am vulnerable. Because God has revealed His will, but I have to find it. Again, look at verse 10. He says, "...with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, 
because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. That God will save us through a knowledge of truth so that we know this is right and then we can obey what we know is right. But if we don't care, then how can we hope to find truth and be saved by it? And again in verse 12, in order that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's what we prefer. We would prefer not to know because we want to do what we want to do. And in that case, there's no hope to find our way through all the competing voices that are saying that they have the truth. So, at the very least, this passage teaches us that if, if we want to believe lies in religious matters, God's going to let us. And if we want to find the truth desperately, that we can. And we can know the truth. And we can find the truth and we can obey it. But we have to be willing to hold on to what is good. We have to test it and then we have to cling to it. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also, wisdom and instruction and understanding. Proverbs 23 and verse 23. This mentality, buy the truth, I must have it, I've got to know, is the mentality we need to have the right kind of mindset in a time like the time we live in. To say, this must be discovered. I must know so that I can know I'm basing my hope on what is true and what is right. Go with me to Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians 1, I want you to see both of these items at work. The idea of testing and the idea of clinging. Galatians 1 and verse 6. Galatians 1 and verse 6 says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. You hear in that the idea of testing. If someone comes and they preach a different gospel, that means we've got to examine it and compare it, like we talked about earlier. Compare it to what we know. Is this what we received before? Is this what's true? Is this what's really from Jesus? And then there is the, the holding fast to what is good or abstaining from what is evil. Because he says, if somebody comes and preaches a different gospel, let him be accursed. Don't have anything to do with him. Instead, he is describing clinging to the gospel that you receive. You need to cling to what you already know is true. This is the mentality of investigation. Is it true or not? And based on that, I'm going to follow it or I'm going to discard it. So, I think I need to say one thing that has kind of been on the periphery of our discussion to this point. I need to say plainly that there are some people who are lying about religious matters. They may not know it, and I'm not suggesting that everyone who says things that aren't true understands and knows those things aren't true, although I'm certain that some are. But we need to understand that a lie believed and followed can have spiritual danger for us. I want you to go with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 8. Colossians 2 and verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in Him, who is the head of all rule and authority. So some people through fancy words and traditions of men and rational arguments and philosophy, all these things he describes here, are trying to cheat you or to take you captive, to take you away from Christ. And he says, you beware of them. Instead, he says, in Christ, verse 9 and 10, is the whole fullness of the, bodhead, of the Godhead bodily. He is everything you need. Down in verse 18, Colossians 2 and verse 18. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by a sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. 
So some through strange and new and interesting teachings or teachings about how you need to neglect your body. You need to do these wild things about angels. There's something new and fascinating. They are cheating you. They are disqualifying you. They're taking you away from Christ. This is the climate of the New Testament, by the way. Sometimes we think that the New Testament era was an era where everybody just agreed about everything. Uh, Not so at all. It was an era when there were people going around teaching about the Gnostics, teaching people to worship angels. There were people going around teaching about this false humility and asceticism, that really what you need to do is kind of live like a hermit. You need to be away from everybody and neglect your body. False teachers of every stripe and flavor abounded in the New Testament era. And this is God's solution. Test all things. Hold fast what's good. That's what God says. That's our response to that. Because in Christ is everything we need. Or verse 19, holding fast to the head from whom everything flows. Everything we need comes from Him. There is something to cling to and there is something to discard. So, if that was the climate of the New Testament, and people in New Testament times need to be wary, let no one disqualify you, let no one cheat you, let no one take you captive, How much more is that true today in the climate in which we live? So, test all things, hold fast what's good. What does that mean practically? I want to give you a few concluding thoughts. First of all, uh, we all need a familiarity with the Bible. That's the only way we're going to be able to distinguish, is to know what actually is in God's Word, what it says, and what it means. We need to know that. We cannot just trust that other people are going to tell us accurately what is here. We need to be able to search for ourselves because we're going to give an account for ourselves. All teaching is measured by the Bible, including my teaching, including every teaching that goes on here. It's all Bible teaching or else. And so we need to know the Bible so we can evaluate it by that so that we can know this is true or this is not. Second, uh, we all need an ability to open-mindedly evaluate all ideas. That is a long way of saying we all need to think. We all need to think. Open-mindedly evaluate all ideas. Test all things. I want to say this. Of all people, Christians should be the most open-minded. We test all things. Everything deserves a hearing. That doesn't mean we believe it all. We test all things, but we only hold fast what's good. So we need to be willing to listen. We need to be willing to hear people out. We need to be willing to hear, even if things sound strange or outlandish, because we test all things, but we hold fast what's good. Open-mindedly evaluate all ideas. Especially, I want to warn us, because we have a tendency to get sort of where our thinking is traditional. And if things are not traditional, then we, we throw up roadblocks. That Traditional is not the standard. The standard is the Bible. Is it biblical or not? I'll give you an example. So, uh, we have, from time to time, efforts we make to preach the gospel throughout the week, and we call them gospel meetings. Gospel meetings. Now, I don't know how much experience you've had talking to people who don't have familiarity with what a gospel meeting is, but they have no idea what a gospel meeting is. If you say, hey, we're having a gospel meeting, they'll say, what is that? And so I I have usually just taken to saying, oh, it's just a revival meeting. And they say, oh, okay. Now, Revival meeting. It's different terminology, isn't it? Okay? But what do I mean? I mean the same thing as a gospel meeting, right? It's just terminology that people would understand. So if someone were to say, oh, you're having a revival meeting, are we going to correct them? Or are we going to evaluate that idea? Well, what do you mean? What is that? See, there's a biblical perspective that says, well, it doesn't matter what you call it. If it's a scriptural idea, then it's a scriptural idea. Do you see what I mean? We can bristle because things are not traditional. I could give you a lot more examples, but I think you get the idea. The idea is, what's the real standard? 
The standard is not what do we typically do. Remember James said, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. There is a time, brethren, for us to think. And it's okay if it takes us a little while to think through something biblically. We can't be offended when this process happens to us. There are going to be times where I get contradicted biblically. I say or I do something that is wrong according to the Bible. And I have one option when that happens. I need to submit and change. Accept the rebuke. Sometimes our understanding of things is going to be challenged or examined, and we cannot be offended when that happens. Let me give you an example. Sometimes someone will say something in a Bible class, and that something is just something that I, as a teacher, or someone else as a teacher, just can't. It's wrong. It needs to be corrected. And so when that happens, inevitably, when we're in the class, we get our feelings hurt because... Well, I've been corrected. I've been called down. I was wrong. And I just want to remind you, this is our obligation as we seek truth. Not to hurt one another's feelings, not to do that in a tactless way, but to pursue truth together. And sometimes that's going to mean some things are wrong. And we have to be able to say that without fear of hurting one another's feelings. And let me tell you, it works the other way too. And you all know this. Sometimes I'm going to preach things and you just say, that's not right. And I can't get offended at you because you come up to me after my sermon and you say, yeah, that wasn't right. I can't be offended. You can't be offended. We're all seeking God together. We've got to be prepared to put our feelings aside for a minute and say, this is more important than whether or not I get offended. This is about seeking God's truth. It is a dangerous sign when we accept everything someone else says, no matter who they are. Even if they're our brother, even if they're our relative, maybe perhaps especially when they're our brother or our relative. It's a dangerous sign when we begin to think we've already found the truth, and so we cannot be questioned about it. That's a dangerous sign. We need to be willing to not be offended when the process happens to us. We can investigate without being disagreeable. Did you know that's possible? It is possible to really seek truth without being argumentative or difficult. Some religious people are just curmudgeons. They will argue with anyone about anything. I heard a brother one time say it was like they were baptized in pickle juice. Okay. The idea is they're just going to be difficult because they're difficult. I have seen brethren argue when they agree. And maybe it wasn't worded the right way. We can investigate without being disagreeable. It's not a license to nitpick everybody and everything. It is an invitation to a life of pursuing truth of God together. We cannot dismiss uncomfortable issues. There are going to be some things that are really comfortable. I can preach the truth about uh, polygamy. That doesn't bother me at all. I've got a wife. I am not looking for another one. It doesn't faze me. Preaching the truth about polygamy is not hard on me. But there are some things that to talk about the truth in an honest way, very challenging. There are some sins that are true that way. There are some things that we're going to do as a group, or church activities that are true that way, where the truth about that is going to be more challenging. But we can't dismiss something just because it's not comfortable. If we love truth and we cling to truth and we're going to test everything, then we have to be willing to tackle things that are hard. Because truth sometimes is hard. And finally, we need to be prepared to work. Not one of us is born with a truth meter. It's already set. We have to discover truth. We have to develop it. We have to fine-tune it and hone it over time. Now, our skill in that is going to improve as we do more work. But even when we're extremely skilled, we can never just let the guard down and say, you know what, I've got this. I figured this all out. We're going to have to work. Now, Sometimes we don't like that, and so it comes back to where we began. You say, you know, it's easier just to believe what somebody else says. Let's just follow the elders, let them study all that out, and let them make the decisions, and I'll just kind of lay back and, and let them do what they need to do. I'll follow that preacher, you know. He's doing all right. I just think, if he says it, that's good enough for me. 
Or maybe it's tempting to go the other way and say, you know what, if it's going to be this much work, I'm not sure I want to be a Christian. And so I'll just be skeptical about everything. I don't trust any of those people. I don't know what their really, really their agenda is. I am suggesting to you that the Bible's instruction to us will require some work. Test all things, hold fast what's good. But it is work that is worth it. Because when I can know that what I'm doing is what God really wants me to do, when I know that I'm in fellowship with Him because I can read about it in His Word and I can know I'm obedient to that Word, there is no substitute for the confidence that produces to know the truth and to obey it, to have sought it and know God has answered my prayer. Seek and you'll find. So, what about you? Talked a lot about seeking truth, talked a lot about investigating. There might be someone here this morning who needs to know the truth about Jesus, the truth about what he's done for us, the truth about his will for us. And I invite you, if you don't know that, to pursue it. And if we can help you by studying with you, spending time with you in the Word of God, and showing the Word to you, I would love to do that. We would love to do that. Please give us that opportunity. But if you're ready right now, because you've come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that He died for your sins, and you know what Scripture teaches in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know you want the forgiveness of your sins. You're willing to turn away from your sins and to be buried with Him in baptism. If you're ready to take that step, we invite you to come to the front right now as we stand and sing.